Good evening, everybody. It is April 8th, 2015, and this webinar is a long time coming, obviously. So we've been talking about this. I've been talking about this now for at least a couple of years, and I'm really excited to be able to, to talk about and announce my book this evening and talk about the principles because I, I think it really does capture. In fact, the webinars are where it was born. It does capture the principles that are woven throughout most of these webinars. So look forward to talking to you about it this evening. So probably mostly as a result of the webinars, but also some of my parent meetings and speaking engagements, people asked me for a few years to write a book. Why don't you write this stuff down? And, and part of that was laziness, but a, a deeper challenge for me was I didn't know what I had to say. I, I knew I could speak to a topic that, or, or a principle that, that existed, but did I have anything unique to say in this experience? So I started to ask myself the question, what could I write? What would I write besides just talking about enmeshment or relationships? What would, what's my unique offering if I were to write a book? And what came to me was this. I had stories. I had the stories of all the parents and all the families that I worked with. And I had my own story. And in my own story, what I came to realize was it's not a specific decision or an answer or a direction that creates my wisdom or is the wisdom that I would offer to anybody else. But it really is learning how to think. And that's really what I try to do on these webinars and in parent meetings is I try to teach parents how to think. I, I try not to give answers. I try not to really create a, a dynamic where parents become dependent upon the expert to provide answers. But really what I try to do is facilitate a process where we're all thinking differently. And even myself, I need help to think differently sometimes. And that's why I still go to therapy. And that's why I use people in my life, certain people in my life to create for me the same experience that I create for parents, which is let me get clear. Let me figure out how I, I can think about this question, how I can come to a, a conclusion or an answer that is authentic for me. So that's a, a lot of what I thought about when I set out to write the book. <clears throat> and I start off with a very personal story in the book. I start off with the story of my life and of my marriage. And in 2010, it was really at a crossroads. It was at a point where I didn't know if I wanted to stay married, didn't know if it was going to be the right thing for me, it was going to be healthy for me, for my family, for my children. And so I, I was invited, I was discussing this with a couple of colleagues, and at one point, one of the colleagues shared that they were having similar types of questions and they wanted to go to a workshop, an intensive. So I mentioned in passing, this idea that I might want to go to this intensive. And it wasn't 10 minutes later that I was signed up for it. One of the people that I was in the car with that I was discussing this with was an interventionist. And if I've learned one thing, you don't share a, a kind of desire about something for yourself therapeutically in front of an interventionist unless you're fully willing to do it. So he excused all of my excuses easily. And we got to the point where I was on the phone with the admissions person and with the owner and I was signed up to go 10 minutes later, and this is about two weeks out. So I show up at the, at the program in Tennessee, and I, it's pretty surreal for me. I get on the shuttle bus, and I take my ride out to, to the program. And first thing is everybody started asking questions in our meeting, in our, in our welcome meeting, about their life and about what they wanted to figure out. And the leaders, the guides, simply said, we're not going to talk about anything present day. We're not going to discuss that until the last day. If you still have this question on the last day, you can ask it. But for now, we're going to talk about our histories. We're going to talk about our family of origin, the roles, the rules, the, the things that we learned growing up about ourselves and about the world and about relationships. And that's what we're going to focus on. So day after day, we focus on these very powerful, intensive groups where we learned about ourselves and learned about each other in our small group of 10 about, about each other's family of origin. So we go through this process, and it wasn't the first time that I'd ever learned about or thought about my family of origin, but it was a powerful and rich experience with this small group over five and a half days. So it comes to the last day, and we're allowed to ask a question. In fact, we we're allowed to set up one role play. So we sign up on the board. I chose fifth, I think, because I thought that's safe. I don't want to go early, and I don't want to wait till the end. I'm going to pick something in the middle. And so we get to this point where we're, we're going to do these role plays. And so I watch the first couple of people go through their role plays where they get to have a discussion with a spouse or a discussion with a parent or a discussion with a, some other somebody else in their life, a child maybe. And what I realized after the first couple of role plays and, and, and reflecting on my story, my question, what I came with 
was I didn't have any more questions. What I realized was the question is not the question. It's not about what should I do. It's about first, who am I? And then from there, what, what do I want? What are my values? What do I believe? What do I need for myself? What, what can I do? What do I feel comfortable with? All those questions, that, that, that light on, on the self, that, that know thyself experience. And from there, I realized I know what I want. I was just scared. And I was afraid of, of getting hurt. I was afraid of not being in control. I was, I was afraid of, of letting go. I was afraid of all of those things, but I knew what I wanted. And, and I knew where I stopped and, and everybody else started. So that was the first idea that I had that brought me to this, this idea for this book and really where it leads from is to teach parents how to think about parenting and really provide them with an enduring source of truth, which is themselves. I, I believe and, and I've learned that we have buried beneath all of our fears, all of our guilt and shame, all of our anxieties, we have wisdom. We have all that we need. And, and all of those, those shoulds and have tos and musts and the, the constructs of our society and, and specifically of the context that we grew up in, which is mostly our family of origin. All of those things create, create a, a shadow that, that overcasts, that, that, that hides from us all of our wisdom. So my process as a client and now my process as a therapist is to facilitate a process that allows parents to access their own hidden wisdom and truth. And also, it's just as important to discover why we don't know it. Why, why don't I know the answer to this question? What's getting in the way? And we become, I become, you become much more comfortable as we discover what commonly gets in our way to, to find that wisdom. And an important part of this process is always starting from intent because when we start to think about outcomes, and think about all of the questions that you have from, with your children. And I know that your desires for your children are absolutely born out of love and their welfare. And so that, that, that complicates it a little bit. But essentially, it's the same idea. When we think about making decisions based on outcome, we are really trying to control another person, which is philosophically impossible. Although we, we believe it practically because we have experience of being influenced and influencing other people. But, but in reality, we, we ultimately have no control over anybody else. And the only control, you know, that, that, the, the, the last domain that we, that we can explore is ourselves, the, the deep parts of ourselves that have been shaped by our context, by our experiences, and, and in relationship to our choices. So the most important question then becomes, why am I doing it instead of what to do? I, I would say that to parents over the years, over and over again, especially as they would ask questions around aftercare. What should I do? And, and I see my role as saying, okay, well, before we answer that, before you even answer that, let alone me, let's talk about what you're thinking and what you want and what's, what's, what's getting in the way. And when we can pick and tease that apart, then we can find the truth. And then you can make a courageous, honest, authentic decision. And then you can practice the, 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 the spiritual chore, the emotional chore, the, 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 the psychological chore of letting go of the outcome. And, and amazingly, in those moments that we practice that sort of being, being in the world and being in relationship, in the moments that we practice that sort of thing, we are incredibly impactful and incredibly effective at, at encouraging change in those around us for the better. Notice I don't use the words control or making it happen, but it does lead to that kind of influence, that kind of really, uh, that kind of impact on other people. Another thing that I thought about when I, when I wrote the book, I, I knew I was going to have to talk about behavioral sc skills and tools because that's every parent's question. I knew I was going to talk about communication tools and skills, but I, I realized I can teach those, and those are pretty simple, especially in a book, even more than a webinar or, or, or a discussion, because you can list them, and they're there, and you can refer back to them. But more importantly, I, I re recognize this idea that parenting skills and tools are not for changing children, but for changing parents, and that change can have a profoundly positive impact on the family. And so all of the things that we talk about, all of the parenting sessions that we have, all the curriculum that we have is aimed at changing parents, not children. And it's a trick. It's almost a trick of the mind. With that change comes powerful, impactful leadership 
and influence. But, but, but to, 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 to be effective, we have to constantly, consciously remove ourselves from this is going to do this or I can get this person to do this or what buttons can I push? And we learn, you know, think about the listening tool. Think about the I feel statement as, as simple examples. We learn so powerfully parts of ourselves. This is what I feel. This is what my belief is. When this thing happens in life, this is how I tend to interpret it and feel about it. And this is what I can and can't control. And I'm going to state that in my hope for myself and hope for others. When I learn to listen, when I learn to listen, I create a dynamic and a process with the other that is incredibly healing and powerful. And I also begin to understand, because we all have this, I begin to understand those urges that we have to try to do something other than listening. listening. And, and we ask ourselves, we say, why, am I doing, why do I want to respond? What, what's the purpose of me responding? And, and that really does reveal an incredible amount of insight, which is I want to make them feel better. I want to take away their feeling. I want to talk them out of their belief so that they're not upset. Right? I, I want to justify myself. I want to defend myself. And, and you can go down that list of, of things that you think about when you're about to speak, when you ask yourself the tough questions. And then you understand, gosh, that's part of my work. That's what I need to do. And that's how, that's a small example of how parenting skills and tools can create change in the parent. And if you know somebody in your life who is an, an effective listener, a wonderful listener, you know how absolutely compelling and intriguing that is. So I start off with this idea of, of course, of, of the symptom, the symptom that our children are presenting with. And this could be, this can apply, like I say in the, the book, this can apply to just about any relationship. In fact, the parents who I work with who, who most love what we talk about and teach in our program say to me, this changed everything for me. So this can apply to anybody. So in terms of changing behavior, using behavioral tools is fine, but only if they are nested in love and awareness. And we would be wise to first listen to what the behavior is telling us before we launch into changing it. Sometimes we listen to what they are not able to say to provide them comfort and provide them comfort. To do this, we follow the trail of crumbs back home to find the child. And there we will offer them company and warmth and they and they heal themselves. So this idea it doesn't matter what the behavior it doesn't matter if it's drugs, cutting, whatever it is. Try to find the the, the place, the space, the, the the containment is what we call it in therapy, so that you can listen to it and understand this is where my hurt is and this is where my anger is. And ideally, listening includes this actually. We hear it without judgment, without correction, without wanting to change it or or, or mold it or dismiss it. So, and I say this with the students in the field all the time. I can say this with parents also. Let's slow down before we work toward behavior change. Because if we don't learn what the behavior could be telling us, we're really not going, going to address the, the root of the issue. It's like mowing off weeds at the surface. We really don't get to the, the life of it. And that's that imagery of following the trail of crumbs of the behavior back to what is at the root of every symptom, which is a wound, a hurt some kind of pain. And that's again how we teach people to feel, is we teach them to make that connection themselves through, through repetition and practice with each individual symptom or action or behavior. I talk about this, and this is actually one of my first favorite webinars, is this idea about being controlling versus being influential, and this idea that in parenting and in all relationships, again, that when we attempt to try to control the other, we actually lose control we actually become less influential. But most importantly, I wanted to illustrate that strictness, because, because most people make this mistake. Strictness and control are not on the same continuum. They're on different axes. You can be controlling and permissive. You can be controlling and strict. You can be influential is what I'm calling it, and permissive, or you can be influential and, and strict. The control isn't about the level of structure. And that's why students, many of them who come to us, thrive in our program with a higher level of structure than they have ever experienced and may ever experience in terms of the supervision and the rules. They can adjust to that and even thrive. But what people can't adjust to at all or almost at all is emotional control, is guilt, is, is the subtle... Uh, hidden messages, the covert messages that we all send to each other. What we can't deal with is our mothers or fathers or spouses or friends or, or family members 
trying to get us to change. And usually that happens through a, through a subtle process. It doesn't necessarily happen through a process that is overt. And, and those are the most difficult kinds of elements of control to cope with for, for a child or for anybody. So we learn to separate them out. We learn to separate. And the story that I tell is the story of working with a, a bulimic daughter, a family where the, the mother started to struggle as I started to encourage certain rules and limits in the house might be a part of their structure. And the mother interrupted me because they'd been through many, many treatment facilities before me. And the mother interrupted me and said, I, you, Brad, what you don't understand is that eating disorders are about control. And so we can't engage in that kind of control. And I reminded the mother or interrupted the mother and I said, I'm not encouraging control. Controlling is when you tell your daughter, th these were quotes, that she looks disgusting or that she'll that no boy will ever want to marry her or that you never would have done this to your mother that's control that's emotional coercion but setting up limits and boundaries is independent of that where we set it up and then we let go of the outcome then we let them choose and then we follow through with the consequence and I, I think all of us can identify with the difficulty in that simple plan set up the consequences positive and negative let them make their choices and then let the consequences do the teaching. That's, that's a difficult thing because we want to control it. We want that good, wise, healthy behavior. But, but good consequences work either way. Whether the child acts appropriately or acts inappropriately, the lesson is still there. The wisdom is still offered to them in that exercise. So I wanted to, to make sure that, that parents know about this idea about where the control comes from. And so one of my favorite stories of all time is a young man who came to me, threatened to commit suicide. We had him on suicide watch for a long time. Heroin addict, defiant, single mother, vulnerable mother. Um, and, and, and it was really difficult to, to manage and keep safe for the first month of the program. And, and toward the end, he found out that he was coming home, not going to an aftercare program against my recommendations. But it was just the circumstances in the family that the mother felt and I supported her that it had to be done this way. So I remember sitting in the last session with him and with her and him saying to her a couple of things, him saying to her, I never felt so free as I did here in the program. And how profound that, that, that was. And I asked him, I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, I was allowed to like it, hate it. I was allowed to believe in it, believe what you said. I was allowed to hate you. I could state my opinion and there was no attempt to try to get me to change my opinion. There was just boundaries and consequences and limits. And I felt free. And, and, and he also went on to say it was in some ways the easiest time that he'd had in his life in the past several years. And of course, that makes a lot of sense to us with somebody who's struggling with such a dangerous addiction. So getting this idea, learning how to separate out our emotional coercion, our hidden messages, our meta messages. And this is all, of course, embedded in the context of communication theory and communication skills. So why do we learn communication skills if it's not to change the children? We tell our children how we feel so we can be present with them and more intentional in our response to them. When we use healthy communication skills built upon a foundation of deeper principles and understanding, we create a safe place for our children and beckon them out of self-medicating symptoms and into genuine feeling. Communication skills become the tools for unpacking the pain beneath the symptoms. So that's what we do. That's the context that we provide. We can't force it. We can't, you know, sh pull it out of them, but we can create the safety in the context. And of course, an important part of communication skills is listening. And listening, listening teaches and encourages and, and, and shapes us to be more patient and to be a, a, a safer person in this relationship. But we don't, and, and most of us, when we think about communication skills, kind of intuitively, when we just imagine them, we, we think about what impact is that going to have on others. I teach this to staff all the time. We talk about this with our students. I talk about it on the webinars. You don't tell somebody how you feel so that they are then obligated to change to make you feel different or better, even your, with your child, even with their symptoms. That's not what we do because that kind of wiring, that kind of training doesn't teach a child to figure things out and learn about themselves and know themselves. It teaches a child that they're responsible for another person's feelings. And that kind of wiring creates a vulnerability to peer pressure and to other influences in their life that you don't want them subject to. So we don't want to wire our children to be responsible for my frustration, for my anger, for my fear even, or for my disappointment. Even if we could argue that all of those things might be lined up in some kind of objective way 
to promote healthy behavior, we still don't want to do that because the process is more damaging than the outcome in, in that example. You can't fake it. Tools and skills. I mean, there's this idea about fake it till you make it. And that, that, that doesn't mean that you're faking it. It just means practice it. Let it change you is what it means. But what I've learned is that what we think about our children is how, will they, is how they will think about themselves. Simple as that. You know, that, that, that inner voice that you have, that sometimes critical inner voice, that's going to be your voice and my voice. And, and, and it comes to us out of, out of worry and concern for their well-being and health and safety. But how it gets internalized is I'm broken. I'm bad. Something's wrong with me. I'm sick. So we, we, we learn through the process of communication tools and, and, and a focus on self and self-exploration to provide, again, a safe place for our child. And that safe place is our mind. Right? That's the safe place that we're creating is the mind of the parent. There's this idea about shame and guilt, which I'm passionate about. And, and, and this common idea in, in literature, even in popular culture, that guilt is this idea of I feel bad and about what I did and shame is I am bad. And somehow that makes guilt OK. And that's just not true. That's just not true. Guilt causes people like shame does to hide, to not be authentic. It, it's born out of fear and anxiety and control often. And so. A lot of us, and, and you know this because I work with you and I've been doing this for a long time with parents, we have to learn to dismiss or disregard guilt to do the right thing. I would say seven times out of ten when I ask a parent about a decision that they regret or that they're struggling with or that they're finding challenging to make and I say, what's, what's the barrier? And they say, I feel guilty. I will feel guilty if I do this right thing. So, so guilt isn't lined up with morality. Guilt isn't lined up with our conscience. Guilt is, again, something that gets imposed on us. And we can find a different way to make decisions and to develop, develop morally. It's called love. It's called authenticity and courage. And, and those are the things that can guide us in this process. And feeling. You know, learning to feel. And like I will say later in the webinar, when one learns to feel, this is what we teach our children, when one learns to feel, and the better we get at that, then one recognizes that in others. And that's the development of morality and empathy. But back to this idea of guilt and shame. The young woman who believes she is responsible for her mother's feelings will also feel she is responsible when her friends are upset that she won't go to a party where there's alcohol or that a boyfriend wants to sleep with her. You know, pick, pick the peer pressure example. How is she to know? That, that people expressing disappointment, sadness, upset, frustration. How is she to know that that's not about her if that's the way that she's been parented? And we all have been parented to that in that way in some ways. And we all have parented in that way in some way. So this is a departure. This is a departure from talking about guilt and shame and, and, and even regret and talking about wisdom, accountability, authenticity, and love and courage. You know, those are in the camp of this positive mental health idea, not all those things that are based on fear and anger. So we're, we're talking again about the process rather than a specific piece of content, the process of parenting, more importantly than one specific opinion or direction that you might take or might be advised to take. Like I said, when someone learns to feel their feelings, they can recognize it in others. This is how we develop empathy. So this is why we don't take people who have hurt a lot of people and we don't bombard them with guilt messages. Don't you see how you affected others? I've shared the story about the young woman who after reading a, a horrendously painful impact letter with all kinds of dangerous behaviors and unhealthy behaviors, weeping and crying, the first thing out of her mouth when she shared at the end of the second letter from her parents was, I can't believe what I put them through. Missing the entire point of our program and of the letters, which is this isn't about what you do to your parents. This isn't about their hurt and their anger and their frustration. That's there. And, and that can cause you to ask yourself important questions. But this is about you being a drug addict and prostituting yourself and cutting on yourself and stealing from your family. This is about you being hurt and injured and having these symptoms, symptoms that are destroying your life psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. That's what this is about. And so when I, when I think about it and, and, and I talk to parents and they talk about the hurt that they feel from their children, that's yours to work out. That's not about them. 
And that's not going to be a healthy guide in their life <laughs> because we try to teach them what people think about you is not your problem. It's not your issue. It's none of your business what people think about you. It can inform you. You can listen to it. You can hear it. You can ask yourself questions, but it's not going to be your guide. And that, that's true with, with parents and with everybody. The idea, of course, as a parent is to this idea of learning the process and, and becoming an expert yourself, learning how to think about the process of parenting. And that's why I, I try to resist advice. And it's weird, too, because parents experience me giving advice at times when I don't. Because I'll say things like, it sounds like you want to do this. It sounds like you figured it out. So what you're afraid of or what you're looking for is this. And so this might be an effective way to do that. But, but that's the process. And that's why I, I've learned not only do parents come complaining that the experts at home or the books that they've read or the last therapist said this or said that. And us therapists are idiots anyway, so we're not a reliable source of, of, of truth. But my, in my own experience, they'll ask me a question and then the circumstances slightly change. Just shift 10%. And then they're lost again because they're not capturing the core principles involved. They, they found the solution. It resonates with them. They know that it's true. And that's why over time, learning from several experiences in several contexts, we begin to learn, oh, this is how I'm going to think differently about relationships. And that's why I have a seven-year-old today, a seven-year-old, a 13-year-old, a 20-year-old, and a 22-year-old, and the principles are the same. They're the same with my wife. They're the same with my friends. The core principles, they, they, they cross these, these platforms, these relationships. Right, there are different decisions, and that's when I talk to my muse or I talk to my therapist, and I'll say, hey, I have some questions, and, and I want to talk this out. And they ask me questions back until I recenter myself and find myself again. That's, that's the process of going to therapy, feeling found and then finding myself. But the process, again, is learning how to feel and learning how to, to generalize and, and to find those core principles. So when parents say, well, my child doesn't use drugs, my child doesn't do this, doesn't do that. My child has this problem. Or my child's an adult, not an adolescent, or vice versa. And every therapist at Evoke, and every therapist that I know in the field would say, it doesn't matter. There are certain approaches and techniques that work effectively with certain diagnoses and with certain personalities. That, that's true. You know, AA works for alcoholics a lot. But at the same time, you could walk into an AA meeting as a cutter, never having used alcohol or drugs, and you can get what you need out of it. You could go to a CODA meeting or an Al-Anon meeting where you're hearing everybody talk about their alcoholic husband or wife. And you don't have an alcoholic husband or wife. You have a drug-addicted child or a depressed child who doesn't use drugs. And you can learn, so how are they talking about these relationships? What's the difference? And the parents that come to me and say, it's not, doesn't, I don't relate to it. That's because they're not hearing the core principles. And then when they hear it, they're like, oh, you know what? Everybody should go to these. And it doesn't matter. That's why when I go to CODA or Al-Anon, I don't have a qualifier in my life. I don't. Except for every client that I work with, I don't have a qualifier. But it, it teaches me how to be in relationships even with the child that I have at home who's not struggling or in my, my relationship with my wife. So we learn the process. We learn how to think. We learn a different way of, of thinking about it. So I teach communication skills, I teach behavioral skills, and then at the end of the day, parents will ask me this question. I did this, I tried that, and it didn't work. It didn't work. And, and then that's, that's the discussion, that's the jumping off point. What do you mean work? What's it supposed to do? And this is the answer. Serenity and peace are the result of healthy parenting, not well-behaved children. The question you have about getting it right suggests that doing it right causes someone else to change. I'm sure you are great. And your, and your child's struggles are not about you. Their struggles are their own. So we can talk about unhealthy parenting and healthy parenting, unhealthy living and healthy living. We can talk about that. But we ought not to talk about it in the context of what it causes other people to do, right? I can talk about being a bad husband or a bad father, disconnected completely from whether or not my children act, in, you know, act out or not or whether or not my wife is satisfied in their life. That's just about me. That's just accountability. And so that discussion that we have with parents where they don't want to be accountable to their children or with their children, it's not about being accountable to your children or with your children. It's about saying, I got, a, I got some stuff to do. And if your child uses that against you, and I said this last week in Philadelphia in the meeting, it doesn't matter. Because you're not being accountable to get something. You're not being accountable and in that asking for something in return, like forgiveness, 
or, or, or any other healthy response, you're just being accountable because it's authentic and it's relieving and it's letting down a burden and it's healing. That's why you're practicing accountability in the process. And it is love and it asks for nothing in return. Good parenting is its own reward. Good parenting is good living. It means being a better man, woman, person, friend, self, boss, or employee. Healthy parenting is the end, not the means to an end. And this came to me years ago. I still remember the phone call and where I was sitting where a father wisely asked me, Brad, if it's not about us, why are you talking about us? Why do you teach so much parenting if you're not blaming us for the problems? And I had to think about that. And I realized because it's just a healthy way of being. And that can have, that increases your odds if you want to talk about that that way. It increases your odds about impacting your child. Absolutely. Doesn't control it ultimately, but, but it improves things. And then you get to participate in the relationship in a healthy way. And people will often orient themselves to a, a healthier person that they love. They will often over time, not immediately. In fact, immediately they will reject it and they will punish it and they will not celebrate it and they will tell you to change back. That's the initial response that most people have when somebody gets healthy with their boundaries with, with themselves as they make steps in that direction. But eventually the people that we love and care that, that, that matter to us and that we matter to, they'll often begin to orient, orient themselves around you, line themselves up with you. You become the, the cornerstone in the house that they begin to, to, to make reference to and begin to learn about themselves and learn about relationships. But, but ultimately, again, we, we go back to, and this is the thing that I would say on every webinar I practically have for the past several years, do your work. That's it. Just do your work. That's the best way that you can impact others in your life is to do your work. It's also disarming. It's also inviting. It also feels safe because now you're not the expert, the healthy one that they, that they tend to, tends to trigger a shame or a guilt or a defensive response to. So codependency is kind of what we're talking about. Sometimes I call it co-participation co in the book. Codependency is co-participation. If we are con to contribute to the health of our children, whom we love, then we need to focus first on our relationship with ourselves and then with our children. Only then can we see the relationship we have with our children's problems. And so this question this father asked me years ago goes back to, do you want to participate to inadvertently reinforce behaviors that you don't want to see continue? Or do you want to get clear of it? Do you want to step out of that dance and out of that dynamic and let it be about them or about the other person? No matter how they react or respond to you, let it be about them. So then they have to pick it up so that you're not also suggesting some kind of blame where you're responsible for their behavior and vice versa, right? Because that's really what codependency and co-participation teaches is that we're each responsible for our behavior, right? Your children are causing you to be anxious, aren't they? Your children are causing you to be worried and afraid and sad. That, that's what we think. And if they could change their behavior, we'd be okay. That's not the lesson of the hero's journey. That's not heroic parenting. Heroic parenting is, I'm not a victim. It's not easy. It's hard. But I'm responsible. And I'm going to take this up. I'm going to take up this pain, this fear, this anxiety, this obsessive behavior, whatever it is, and I'm going to work on it. I'm never going to be perfect, and it's not about being perfect, but it is about making it my project. It is about taking steps in that direction. It is about being accountable. It is working on my side of the street. So, And the question becomes always, first, who am I? And then from there, we, we can much more easily see what our boundaries and limits are, what we value. We can much more than see our child and their needs because we, because we don't get confused between what is us and what is them. What is our history? What is our stuff? And what is their stuff? So it's a lot easier. To, we've already removed, to, to the extent that we've done our work, we've rem removed the projections. We've removed the reactivity. We've removed all the transferences that we have on them. And we just see them. It takes a lot of work and a lot of courage and a lot of practice. But we can get to that point. And then we can begin to understand the relationship that we have with their addiction or their depression or their anxiety or their oppositionality, whatever it is. Talk about an attachment and this idea because a lot of parents that I work with that, that are here tonight, you know, have struggled with over identification, right? Their child's pain is their pain. Their child's hurt is their hurt. Their, their child's success is their success and their failure. And again, we learned to think that way as children because we were parented that way. 
But overall identification is the most severe form of poor attachment. It's not the euphemistic, I love too much. It's poor attachment. Over-identification doesn't see the child as an other, but rather sees the child as an extension or reflection of the parent. In such a relationship dynamic, there's only one person, the parent. The child is altogether missing in the parent's mind. So when we struggle with enmeshment and when we struggle with reactivity and when we struggle with over-identifying with our children, taking too much responsibility, helicopter parenting them, snowplow parenting them, you know, pushing the obstacles out of the way. When we struggle with those issues, we have lost connection with our children. We don't see them. And, and that is why, even though you love your children more than I do, and I love my child more than you do, sometimes, because of that, that, that distance, others can see them more clearly than the person who, quote-unquote, loves them the most. Because they don't have their stuff wrapped up in them. They're not overly identified with them. So this, this sometimes we think of it that way. Moving away from codependency. Sorry about the slide. They stretched when I loaded them today. Detachment is not detaching from the person that we care about, but rather from the agony of involvement in the drama. And like I've taught many times, healthy detachment in describing what those psychological, emotional boundaries are, healthy detachment is healthy connection. They're not opposites. They're not variations. It is the exact same thing. In fact, I would like it if Al Anon would change their literature to call it healthy attachment or healthy connection instead of healthy detachment. I really don't want that, but I, I like that language because it begins to remind us as we feel uncomfortable because we were, we were, taught, we were taught implicitly through a, a, a billion invisible interactions as children. We were taught to... to interact with human beings in a certain kind of proximity, emotionally speaking. And we carry that into our lives. All the family theorists and therapists talk about this. And so when we start to pull away and we imagine it being dislike, disconnection, um, unloving, uncaring, when we imagine it's not that, it's just us breaking free of our contact. And we can eventually become separate, more whole, and then through that, that wholeness, or, or as a result of that wholeness, we have a much greater capacity to connect, to move independently and connect. And so this idea, this, this chapter on codependency is about explaining the, the sometimes very difficult and in, in, in the intricate way that we can talk, talk about and think about what it means to be a self and what it means to be intimate and what it means to be reactive and overly attached and lose connection with others ultimately. Of course, in the end, you're not going to get it right. So the, the, I, I included this cartoon in the book, in this idea. Talk about it in a couple of ways. This is the, the funny, kind of more playful way of talking about it, this three stages of self-awareness. Rather than possessing an internal sense that we are enough, we try to be right, right? We have to be right as parents, as spouses. We try to be right to mask the vulnerability of owning it, which leaves us alone on a psychological island by ourselves. So it's hard to say. And, and I try to practice. This is one of the things I try to practice in my marriage. When my wife comes to me, I say, you don't have to explain. I mean, you can explain it, but you don't have to explain why you feel what you feel. You just get to feel that way. You get to have that want, that desire, that feeling. Because I want the same right. I want to just be allowed to feel what I'm feeling. And I've become so sensitive to that message that people sometimes offer me to not feel what I'm feeling, to not be what I am. So... We weren't taught that it was just okay to feel, that it was just okay to be who we are. We were taught that we had to be right or prove it or justify. That's why we exaggerate. That's why we lie. We want to say, if I told you the story, you'd probably try to talk me out of my feelings, but I'm going to exaggerate it. Not even consciously, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. So you'll say, of course, your, your boss is a jerk. I can see why you're so frustrated and hurt. So we don't walk around with this internal copy knowing that. And so we mask it with this idea of being right. And in the end, when I talk about heroic parenting, I'm going to get to that and why the title of the book is that, is this principle. If we fail to embrace, no matter how painful or scary, the journey of parenting a struggling child, we will also miss the treasure that journey has to offer. For me, parenting struggling children offers many gifts, including increased compassion for others who suffer, clarity and recognizing our boundaries, and improved self-care. Self and I really do believe this, and I know that it's hard, especially for the new parent. But this is a great teaching opportunity, an expanding, a transforming opportunity. 
And if we can embrace that, if we can feel it and feel everything and know that we're where we need to be, we turn from a victim to a hero in this hero's journey that I'll talk about in just a moment. And that's the, the core essence of becoming and living the heroic parenting. I want to say this. A book is not therapy. Information is not therapy. Me giving webinars is not therapy. It, it is useful. It has its place. I read books. I listen to lectures myself. And it has its value. But I want to share with you this idea that doing therapy is something entirely different. And doing therapy, I don't teach this much or talk this much. I listen. And I try to help the other person find. And it requires me to have a certain kind of sensibility about me. And in the moments that I'm doing it, I'm full of compassion. In the moments I'm doing it well, I'm full of compassion, non-judgment, curiosity, interest. And I'm helping them find themselves and feel comfortable and understand why they do what they do and that it makes sense. In another context, in another time, it absolutely makes sense. And when they know that and they can look at their symptoms compassionately, no matter how repetitive or stupid they seem to the outside world or to them, to their critical voice or even to me and my own judgmental voice, no matter how crazy they look, it makes sense. And when you understand it that way, you can heal. It's not a behavioral change. You can heal. You still have to work. It still takes courage. You still have to face fear. But you're actually addressing the real issue, the real thing. So I just wanted to tell you that. And then I want to read. I'm going to read, explain something to you. I didn't name the book. My publisher named the book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent. I have a a working copy here and I'm going to read you the, the last page. In the beginning of the book I describe Joseph Campbell's idea of the hero's story and it's basically this pattern that he identified in all religions and all epic stories. He talks about how th this, this character in the story goes through this transformational process and he describes it, it's, its stages. And the initial stage is the call to adventure, right? being called to, 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 this, to this calling, whatever the calling is, whatever the story is telling. And, and he says, initially, the call is almost always refused. And, and in a powerful way, you have encouraged and even kind of shoved your children into this, this story, to, to this hero's journey. You've given them a very powerful call to, to live a more authentic life. And they often, as you know, refuse it. But importantly, I've noticed that parents have that same call. That a depressed child, a, a child who's anxious, a child who's struggling with mental health or addiction, that's the call. And you have this opportunity now to enter this, this journey. And like the child, the call is often refused. And then you go in here. And, and, and like a lot of the heroes, a lot of the heroes quest, they go in looking for the treasure, whatever it is. They go searching for it, for this thing. And of course, what they end up finding is themselves. You go into this scary place. You go into these meetings that we have, into these workshops that we have, into these sessions that we have. You sit in circles with strangers. You go to Al-Anon. You do these things. You go into this dark place that you're afraid to go, which is really just inside of you. It's just the dark place inside of you. That's all that is. That's all the force represents in these stories. And when you watch these, these, these stories, read these stories, and watch these movies and you, you see this template, you think it's the same thing. They're just searching, metaphorically, searching for uh, this thing, but it's really just inside of themselves. And so I end the book with this. Uh, I talk about that at the beginning, and I end the book with this thought. So in the end, what does the hero find? On his journey, he finds the elixir, healing wisdom, something he can share with others. We experience deep pain and develop compassion as we face the depths of our own struggles. And what we find is our story. We sit in groups, tell our stories, and listen to the stories of others. That is the message of this book. That is what I meant when I started with the concept of the question is not the question. It is our struggling children and our willingness to ask different questions that reveal our authentic selves. The hero brings back herself, a deeper, richer version of herself. Loving your, old chi loving your child is something you cannot not do. You will break and bleed. Old things will die in you, and in their stead, new ones will grow. And what will you have in the what you will have in the end is your story. For me, even as a as a teacher, 
the elixir isn't always in the form of words. Some of what I have gleaned on my journey is difficult to put into words. That is because it, it, it is an experience rather than an explanation. You learn something by going through it that you cannot know any other way. My education and study have given me language, but being present on my painful and beautiful journey has carved out a place for me for more compassion towards others and myself. I am honored to sit and offer some observations from the thousands of hero's journeys that I have seen children and parents traverse. This is my story. This is my gift. This is also the gift that remarkable, wonderful, struggling children and parents have given me, and I, in turn, give it back to you. And that is the hero, the journey of the heroic parent. I don't know if there are any questions, but I'm happy to take them right now if you have any. I don't have a moderator this evening, so I'm just going to have to read them off the screen if there are any. And I'll give, I'll give just a moment before I go over the upcoming events slide in just a moment. And the book and our logo isn't really stretched like that. That's just something that went wrong with the slides tonight. I'll go through the, the slides, and if any questions come in, I'll address them. Actually, I don't seem to have the slides. This is not the version of the, of the presentation where I had the slides to have the upcoming. The next webinar is going to be on, uh, what is it? Uh, it's on Monday at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, it'll be an open forum, so I can take questions then. Uh, and then I'll have a topic one next week. Um, looks like we don't have any questions. So thank you for joining us, me, this evening. And good luck to you on your journey. And may you find wisdom and compassion and new parts of yourself. That you didn't know existed and old parts of you that you don't need anymore although it's painful and scary may you also lose those along the way have a great evening and i'll talk to you on monday night take care bye bye